Derek in a few places over the years at um, certified arborist meetings, um, Georgia certified landscape professional meetings and different venues like that. He, I don't know him well. I'm looking forward to this presentation today. Uh, he's at May, Middle Georgia State University. There you go. And I'm sure he's going to tell us all about that, but I'm just really excited to hear Derek talk to us about what he's learned, what he does, how he improves things on the campus of Middle Georgia State University. Let's welcome Derek Catlin. Thank you everybody for having me here today. Um, get my PowerPoint up and running. I'm going to fly through some of my introduction stuff. I've got a lot of information to cover. I do know, uh, I changed the, had a couple slides out of order, so in your handouts, you're going to get a little confused in one or two slides because I moved them. Mainly there's, mainly there's a group of, of islets toward the rear, and I brought them up into the, the tree portion of my PowerPoint there. This PowerPoint's kind of a accumulation of a couple borrowed PowerPoints and three or four of my own. So uh, you got the, the best of the best. And I try to make sure it's all native. I think I got, I'm, I do mention one hybrid plant at one point. Don't, don't throw rocks and stones on that. <laughs> so let me preface it with that. But uh, this August will make 10 years for me with the college. Started out working for Macon State College. Uh, and my slide still says Middle Georgia State College, but I believe last week we officially became university. Middle Georgia State University. So now I have to go update the slides, new business cards, all of that good stuff. So I apologize for some of the, these logos as we continue to transition into the university. Um, this was a highlight of my 10 years probably. I got to go up South Carolina with Dr. Waddell Barnes and we went and looked at the tea plantation in Charleston. Our, our real mission there, we wanted to come back and do a, a tea garden display at the college. So we went there to look at tea trees, but we couldn't pass up a little trip to the Angel Oak, the biggest live oak on the East Coast, possibly the oldest tree on the East Coast. Uh, somewhere, some people estimate 900 years, some people say maybe 1,400. So it's an amazing tree. It's the, it's the best free tour you can get in Charleston. You just pull up. They let you walk all on the root zone. There's some pretty questionable stuff there, but uh, it's a great, great tree, and uh, hopefully it's there for many more years to come. That's kind of our goal and what we do. Uh, unfortunately, all of them don't make it that long. So you see, the, our college started as Macon Junior College, 1967, so we're approaching 50 years on the property. You see, initially they put in a bunch of plants, and in 95 they just decided to try to make it a botanical garden. Just, 2003, the Board of Regents officially named our gardens after Dr. Waddell Barnes. Uh, we had a master plan in place in 2000, and 2008, April, we were in Southern Living. Uh, thought we finally made it, per se, right? <laughs> April 2008. So what do we do every year out there? Uh, here's some of our list of events that we do. We have a National Planting Day ceremony each fall to kind of kick off the tree planting season. We have a spring garden symposium the end of February each year. I've got some leftover handouts that will show you the agenda, kind of show you what we do. Uh, if you would like to be on our mailing list, we, we mail these handouts out every January. So you can send me an email with your address and I'll get you on that mailing list. Uh, our library has a special collections room dedicated to all things horticulture landscaping. It traditionally has been about five, four or five hundred volumes. Uh, Dr. Waddell Barnes, he donated his entire collection to our library this year. So uh, now we're probably over 1,200 volumes. His collection was larger than ours. <laughs> but we've got some amazing books out there. We've got some books that are very, very old, very classic, along with the newest copy of the Dirt Book. Um, loads of visitor parking, walking trails, and the most fun is this hot air balloons and tunes we do with the Cherry Blossom Festivals. <laughs> That one day we get about seven to ten thousand people on the campus in the gardens walking around. It's a real good day to see the campus. Uh, our website there, mga.edu slash botanical, we keep good bit of information on there up to date. So we made it in April 2008. We were in Southern Lou. May 2008. 
Tornado, total devastation, 3,900 trees, estimated loss, about 95% of the canopy. And uh, every year I'm still cutting down big trees we, we attempted to leave, but they're just hollow, they're rotting away, they're losing limbs. So that's what we've been doing for the last five or six years. Uh, this is, since we're, I'm in Tifton and I'm, we're up in Macon, this is a little slideshow of our lake size, show you some of the trees and the buildings. Beautiful view around this lake. You'll see a lot of the work we've done, all new trees, of course. So there's kind of a little layout of the, the tree planting year by year. Down at the bottom, you'll see 25,000 longleaf pines. We did those hand planted in a field. But traditional landscape plants, we're around 2,000 large B and B container trees in our uh, canopy restoration efforts. Uh, with our devastation, we took that time to use like a blank slate. We did a new master plan with HGOR, Steve Sanchez. One of our major goals is to have on display every native oak tree to the state of Georgia. So this list is what I've already located, sourced, purchased, and they're in the ground and they're living and thriving. Some of them are only a foot or two tall. Most of them are fairly sizable trees. Uh, we're at 26. I'm trying to finalize the list and get Dr. Coder to approve it, maybe, of how many actual native oaks are in Georgia. I think we're dancing. We're looking for around 34 once you classify them as a tree larger than 15 feet. There's a couple species that stay really shrub-like. So uh, while I'm going for all the trees, I'm probably going to try to grab those shrub, shrub like ones while I'm there looking around. Uh, through this restoration project, how does it happen? People like Georgia Power say you can come dig 60 trees a year for three years. So they gave us 60 long leaves a year. We brought, brought a contractor tree spade and we got to go up there on a nice foggy December morning and can dig 60 trees. Uh, we write grants like this Georgia Gateway grant through the Department of Transportation. And uh, I got the pleasure of doing the landscape design, the whole ride up, and you'll see I used a plethora of native shrubs and trees. Um, very, very fun project right there on the, on the roadside for everybody to enjoy. Uh, as we expand, we, uh, the college is to the east of this photo. This is a property to the west that we purchased about eight years ago. About 250 acres of what was farmland. Farmer stripped the soil, put his kids through college, and the Georgia Department of Natural Resources helped him with some soil restoration. And then we try to go in there and plant long leaves to see how successful we can be. So needless to say, we did not skip a step. We did subsoil and chemical site prep, scalping, hand planted seedlings that were in soil plugs. So we could just do everything we could do. And we replanted Three years later, true to numbers, we had 75% success rate. So, a uh, very successful project when done at, at optimal timings with the best known practices. Um, when you start trying to plant trees, we're going to just make sure you're asking the right questions. What's the purpose of the tree? What are the desired characteristics? Why do you want to plant the tree in that location? And if you're looking at that location, you've got to have a tree right there. Make sure you know what that site's all about. Know what's underground, know what's overhead, know how much sunlight you get, and maybe consider if it's in a real high wind location. Um, just another little list of some soil factors. I'm going to run through these slides. I'm trying to get to the fun stuff. I want to get to the trees. So we're looking at all these things like this, how much you want to take care of it. Some people say that's a bad decision. I call that a successful urban tree. <laughs> Not many of them make it that long, nor do they get that large. So if it's come time to cut it down and replace the concrete, nowadays we would try to put structural soil underneath. We would try to do porous concrete in that area and allow a big tree to actually have a little more roots on it, get a little larger. And we still try to get them to put another large tree. If it's, if it's four to six foot wide, we still try to push for that that oak tree, if we can get enough soil volume in that area. But soil volume is the key. Um, when it's not soil volume, you've got to ask yourself about drainage and moisture. Is the site irrigated? Is it in a really low wet spot that does not drain? This picture is from somebody's front yard where they had paid for a 10-foot Japanese maple three times. <laughs> So they finally decided to call somebody besides their guy that cuts their grass. <laughs> 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 and 
And I go to dig up the stump, and I, man, it hadn't rained in a week. <laughs> Take a picture of this, let me think about it. After a little bit of discussion, what is somebody that, that thinks about cost, effectiveness, and a happy plant? Little King River Birch is a dwarf river birch, loves wet spots, great year round, all winter long. It's exfoliating on the bar, gets about 15 feet tall in 20 years. Very comparable to size and form of a Japanese maple, but it thrives in a wet location. So we're just simply swapping the species back to a native species that likes a wet spot. Customer's very happy, very low maintenance plant. Worst thing that happens is this plant, you get aphids and you get black leaves, so it is, does take a little bit of insecticide to keep the aphids off. But, uh, so also, you, you know what the site is, you know what kind of plants you want, possibly. Uh, when you're selecting your plants, look for healthy plants, so don't be scared to flip them out of containers and check those roots. You kind of, you're looking for these vi vibrant, colorful roots, not all that just black death in the bottom. A lot of pots will have one side of blackness, that's where the sun was cooking the roots in a black pot. Real nice growers, double pot them, put them in the ground, and you won't have that problem. But their plants might cost an extra two dollars. But their operations just a lot more about quality, not so much about low price. So uh, just really be cautious about your plants. And some people tell you that that plant on the left is as good as it gets in the nursery. But if you go to the right place, you're dealing with the right grower, you can get real vibrant root balls in these small containers. So uh, any slides formatted like this, I borrowed, and their credits will be at the rear of my presentation. It was the, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and it's a, a lot of species and a lot of comments. Some I agree with, some a little bit situational, but they're good. We, we like to say red maples are good. They grow fast. They're native plants, beautiful fall colors, a lot of great attributes about this red maple. This far south, if you're having on a roadside or the edge of a parking lot, full sun with a brick house behind it, I don't think the red maple is your best decision for that particular location. You'll get a lot of leaf scorch. It'll look like they need irrigation. No matter how much you irrigate it, the leaves keep scorching back, and then you have scale insects all over the tree. Uh, and it'll just induce a lot of problems when you get these red maples in what I call a heat pocket, or extreme full sun south of making. So these red maples need to be off the hardscapes, more on the property lines, or down in wet spots where you don't quite have so much reflected light and real hot. But overall, they're great trees. Uh, we mentioned October Glory. That's one of the top selling nationwide cultivars of red maple. In Georgia, I kind of call them November Glories. <laughs> they're kind of marketed and bred for a more northern climate. So when you're in, in Georgia, the deep south planting red maples, that October Glory that everybody touts about is not the best selection of red maple, but it's a great tree. Um, this one in particular right here, this is a hybrid of the red and silver maple. This is another one of the nationwide top selling trees. Autumn Blaze, the first red maple to, to color for us down here. That one that real early, real striking, pretty much this Autumn Blaze. Sells real good, grows up to three feet a year. Um, it's crossed with a silver maple and they tell you to stray away from silvers. They grow so fast, weaker limbs. So there's some drawbacks with this tree as well. It's a beautiful, fast-growing tree. Once again, I kind of keep these more away from houses, but the potential for failures a little more, more there. So I keep them away from structures, away from houses, and I still try to keep them away from hot spots. Because you know, silver maples in the deep south don't really thrive. So if you're really in the deep south, what type of red maple, what type of genetics would you want to look for maybe? Uh, this is more of a dwarf. Uh, right now you see the Latins up here, Acer of the Cotoderma. So it's a chalk bark maple, 30 by 30, drought tolerant, nice bark, wonderful fall color. Looks kind of like a sugar maple, kind of like a red maple. The next slide you see the change in Latin chalk bark maple, so now they're calling it a variety. But in the south, it performs much better in the south. It is shorter and smaller, but in urban landscapes, you don't quite have as much space for these trees. So a lot of times, something that's got a little distance in the background, if it's not just the species, 
could actually be much more suited for the location than that 60 foot red maple that kind of dwarfs your house. Maybe something 35 to 40 foot tall might be better. And here's your, your southern sugar maple. You see it's another, they used to be Acer Floridanum, it was an independent species. Now they're grouping it back and they're calling it a variety of your sugar maple. And you'll see uh, sugar maples traditionally somewhere between that yellow on the left and a deep bright orange on the right. But another just a great maple. They're, uh, they're crossing these maples and making all type of hybrids in the trade. And you'll see this, this sugar maple here just got a, I just told you they go red to orange, now you're looking at a red one. <laughs> so uh, with breeding and just techniques, they're really pulling out characteristics that are a little more reclusive. If not, they're doing a little back crossing, so there might be a little red maple hidden in the back of this thing. You never really know. Sometimes they hide them. This is another tree they really tout highly about. It's great in Atlanta. It's great north of Atlanta. I've seen them down in Florida and South Georgia, and this one, if you're really living in this location, there might be some better sugar maples for this location, but that is a great selection. This is more of a columnier sugar maple, so when you want that fall color and you want to break up a, a landscape, you want some kind of frame in your property line, it gets a nice dense head on it, stay kind of tight and high so it won't be so obtrusive over your driveway. It's just a real good tree for the south. Now this one, you'll see it's a hybrid cross um, discovered near Sandersville, Georgia. You see that this, this is a picture of the parent tree that's 60 years old. It's right off a parking lot, gets no leaf scorch, has rarely no scale. It's truly thriving in a heat pocket in Sandersville, Georgia. So this is what we're kind of calling the new red maple sugar maple for the south in these real hot spots. It gets up to 50 feet tall, so it's a little bit larger than your traditional sugar maples. It's a, just a really remarkable tree with a lot of uh, good native backbone to it. When they're young, they're real leggy. They, they like to grow rapidly. They, they grow two to three foot a year when planted properly in a real fertile location. So they're going to have a real open head in the juvenile phase. But then as they start to mature out, they begin to get this real dense head, just a gorgeous plant. So we're going to go to a few of these understory dogwoods here for a minute. And dogwood has always been one of my most graceful favorite trees I see in the spring. The, everything else is beautiful, just eye popping in your face, but then you have the graceful dogwoods on the slopes and the understories. And uh, there's many different cultivated varieties in the trade. If you have a shady back porch, there's a little guy I like called Pygmy Red Dwarf Pygmy. A little red guy he gets about three to five feet tall in 15 years and if you put him in a big container on your back patio with little plants around the base of it it just looks amazing large varieties are cherokee cherokee chief cherokee princess up north we're battling this anthracnose kind of wiping out the native populace on the slopes so i've noted this appalachian spring that was re uh, released by university of tennessee it has real good resistance to this anthracnose. I understand in lower elevations, anthracnose is not a problem just yet, but we're really pushing to plant more this Appalachian spring, hoping that they cross with the native dogwoods in the area. Maybe over the years, we will get more of that resistance in our native populace, in the Macon area in particular. They're, they're saying it was not a problem in Macon, but they said Emerald Ashmore won't come that far south either. <laughs> getting closer every month it seems like. So here's a, here's a picture of this pygmy red in our garden before the tornado. And that's my picture. I'm not a great photographer. There's no lens tricks or anything. It's just a basic snapshot on a dewy morning. It's just a beautiful dwarf dogwood. Truly dwarf. Very, very dwarf. And this is the Cherokee Chief. Just great plants. Um, need to make sure you got good soil drainage on dogwoods. Same thing like with that Japanese maple hole I showed you earlier. 80% of the time when I see a dogwood is not thriving, it's on a transplant, it's not in the best well-drained soils. They like a decent amount of organic material, so I always try to plant the dogwood if they're in a container, I plant them about a third out of the ground, and then get native topsoil and kind of 
bench them back into the landscape so that they're guaranteed positive drainage in that upper profile. It'll do a lot for you as you try to get them through that transplant. Um, true, good, good understory tree for moist sites in the shade. Um, they will burn back in the sun in the south, so it has to be a real good amount of shade for these to perform well. But these Carolina silver bells, 15 to 20 foot tall, spring flowers, very graceful, open, open-headed tree. A lot of times people like to battle these wet spots and they want to run drainage structure and get it off the property and make it where they can run their sprinklers more. And it's a lot of site prep work. I try to really push these wet trees and just tell them to deal with that native site. And long term, you have a much better result long term. You don't, you don't forget to run your sprinklers for a summer and then lose half of your landscape. So just work with that native site and it's more efficient and less maintenance long term. Um, red buckeye is another one of my favorite trees. They, they grow fairly slow. Um, they don't like them transplanted a real large size so this is something I really plant for plant for the Boy Scouts and future generations they they look a lot shrub like for the first 15 20 years and they'll finally get up the tree formed it takes a takes a long time but it's a great native plant this service berry I went on a service berry kick you'll see this is a hybrid brand of flora apple service berry there's many different native species to the southeast and in our gardens, I believe I planted three, three to four separate species in the last four years of service berry. Uh, beautiful flowers, fall colors, decent. Some are beautiful in fall. This autumn brilliance has a real beautiful red fall color. The edible fruit, I read about these edible fruit for a few years and I was interested. Couldn't wait to maybe see and try some. When I finally started harvesting some fruit off of these trees, they're, they're almost better than the blueberries maybe <laughs> they're they're right there with the blueberry to me they're very delicious fruits uh, a little more seedy than a blueberry so i can see why they're not so hot on the market for the edible fruit but the long you don't mind the seeds they're very delicious flavor eastern red buds uh we've collected probably some 15 different cultivated varieties at the college uh, some of our my favorites are listed right here you know, it's a nice understory tree. They can handle full sun. Further south, you kind of need to tuck them back a little. Early spring, right now, they're, they're just performing so great as you drive down the roadsides. Uh, Forest pansy has that purple leaf that kind of turns green through the summer, but it leaves out a good dark purple. Alba has a great white flower color, which is just uh, it's a good contrast, a little more uh, faint, not so in your face. The newest Newcomer on the market that I think is going to be the top selling one, maybe almost to the point of overplanted in a few years. You got to check out this Rising Sun Red Bud. It is a glorious, glorious red bud. The, the new foliage comes out really chartreuse, yellow to orange. And it does this in the spring and it flowers. And then in the summer, when you think it's just going to be this green kind of chartreuse meatball, the mature foliage greens up and then the new growth shoots out this chartreuse yellow orange so it gives you a show all season it's a it's a great red bud um i've got this texas variety of the native species the the varieties from texas are going to have a shinier leaf which kind of looks better in a landscape you got that real glossy leaf they're, they're native more to the texas over there traveler is a weeping form that's reminiscent of forest pansy got a dark purple leaf when it leaves out it'll hold that purple leaf for a few months but it does tend to kind of green up there towards the end of summer but a traveler I've got some I personally like 30 gallon containers at five or six feet and they go about six inches up a year and then cascade to the ground just a great tree I left this picture in here just to demonstrate how that 8%, 10% lean would be an issue if it was an overstory tree. If it was an oak tree that you were growing in your yard, you would want to remedy that while I was young. <laughs> Since it's a red bud, it's only going to get 15 to 20 feet. So if you know what you're dealing with, that tree will hold its own. It'll never be that much of a liability. And I would, I would let that tree do its thing for another 10 or 15 years. You know, a lot of times red buds 
especially on roadsides and in heat pockets, they'll be they'll be like a crab apple or a lot of your understory trees. They're only going to have an expectancy of 10 to 20 years in these real urban settings pushed out, kind of pushing the limits of their ideal situations. This is the uh, native fringe tree, Grancy Graybeard, a lot of different common names for it. A uh, small tree to 20 feet. Traditionally, seedlings are highly variable. So if you plant a bunch of seedlings, you get some that look like shrubs, some that grow a foot and a half a year and turn into a tree. Um, so look out on the market. They've got some cultivated varieties growing now that sure enough have a rapid growth rate, shinier leaf, and they turn into large trees relatively quickly. I purchased some from a grower out of Hawkinsville. The trees were already 14 or 15 feet tall. They said they grew in seven years. Trunks on them were probably four inch nursery caliper. And when, for that to be a Grancy Graybeard, that's just a miracle to me because I've watched my grandmother plant them and I watched them. <laughs> the ones my grandmother planted are still seven feet tall probably right now. So, But the newer ones on the market seem to have a much more vigorous growth rate. The uh, American Holly, kind of hard to find it in its native form in the tray because it's got that chalky leaf surface. They don't have that shiny green leaf like a lot of people want in their formal landscapes. But still a great, great tree. Uh, loves dry areas. Once you get it established, it'll thrive with absolutely no maintenance. Beautiful berries, great time of year. And then if you're in more of a wet spot, I said that's good for kind of an upland dry to a moist site. And you get to your wet spots and you want this privacy head, this low maintenance with red berries. I'd swap to the Ilex Cassine. You'll see there's a couple different cultivated varieties. They have a highly variable leaf form. So some of them have a real lanceolate leaf. They give you a real fine texture, kind of like an olive tree or something. And then the more native species will have this rounded leaf. Um, you'll see it's a, it's a parent of, the, of these hybrids we know as ex Atomenta. Uh, Topal hollies, you'll see they're listed here, Foster, Savannah, East Paklaka, Eagleston, Greenleaf, all very familiar cultivated varieties in the trade. Uh, it's real beneficial to know that you're dealing with cultivars that both parents are native plants to Georgia. So these, these things are bred and, and to be planted in Georgia. They thrive, very low maintenance. Pretty much they got a little more height out of the American holly, they got a little more leaf shine from the cassine, and they both hold good red berries. Um, cultivar to cultivar, very high, highly variable leaf forms though. Um, sticking with the hollies, more of a rounded form, privacy hedge. Um, a lot of these you see they turn them into dwarf shrubs. Some of the Selected forms will hold berries much more readily. This shadow is female. Um, compared to your species you find in the woods, January shadow is female still going to have that many berries on the stems in January. They hold those red berries very persistent. Sometimes they're not even pushing them off this time of year. They're still holding. Uh, birds do eat them, so the birds are stripping down there toward the late summer. So we're going to go to the Southern Magnolias now. This is the shade tree, the evergreen tree for Georgia. It's my favorite tree. Um, they handle the shade fairly decent. They love the full sun. They get real dense in the full sun and put on a real good flower show. Loads of cultivated varieties over the years. Um, Claudia Winemaker. This, if you've got the room, you've got the big landscape, you've got plenty of space. This is the best. Introduced in 1956, still one of the top selling Southern Magnolias nationwide. Uh, something's proven itself like that, you kind of stop fighting it. You just say, that's your, that's your Southern Magnolia. It's got that real desirable toe and toast dark brown underside, more so than a lot of the other selected varieties. So you just got to be cautious. This thing will get 50 to 65, so I've seen them 70 feet tall. So you really need to have the space if you need the height but you don't have the space, uh, this Alta is really narrow, upright, 10 foot wide. And I've seen very mature ones and they're still barely 10 feet. 
wide. So that's a real true spacing on that. Um, I've used them in privacy hedge rows downtown when you've got tight properties and you need some privacy. Instead of using cryptom areas and leaving <laughs> Cypress and all those other things, these function very well. They'll, they go from sun to shade great, so it's a lot of times your property line has variable sunlight. It's a great selection. Um, still got that tone to toast underside leaf, a really fairly sizable blossom, but the uh, foliage is also real <coughs> lanceolate and narrow, so the, the foliage will kind of throw you off when you look at it, not so traditional. Same thing with this dwarf that probably many of you are familiar with this dwarf, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Uh, they, they advertise it 20 by 10 in 20 years, selected in 1959, released in 74. So, I mean, they did their research. They, they took their notes. Uh, maybe not in Georgia. I mean, I've seen, I've seen them 35 feet tall. Really old specimen of this. They have a, a dwarf growth rate per year. But I think no matter how old this tree gets, it's still going to keep that dwarf rate. It's going to continue to grow. It's easier to control with reduction cut pruning. So if you've got one in the front of your yard, it is possible to, to maintain them at a smaller size. But just a little warning to when you're reading those tags, pay attention and know what you're dealing with plants and that people don't know everything. They haven't been released for that long. A lot of times they will outgrow what they sell them as. The newest one on the market for a dwarf southern magnolia is this teddy bear. It looks like it's going to be a huge southern magnolia. It looks like a Claudia Winemaker that you don't feed. It's got the big traditional leaves, very dark brown on the bottom, large flowers. Only thing dwarf about it is the growth rate. And it's very dwarf growth rate. Nurseries don't like growing them because it takes a long time to get one to five or six feet. But if you buy one that's five or six feet tall, you won't have to mess with it. <laughs> it'll, it'll slowly get to 15, 25 feet tall maybe, but I'm seeing six inches, four inches of growth a year. And uh, just a very beautiful plant, but everything about it says Southern Magnolia. Uh, this slide says the good, the attribute says the best overall oak tree, great street tree. And that makes me do, because me being the tree guy, these things, if you have a willow oak in the south, you have a canium scale. Go check the tree. <laughs> Go look up a canium scale. There's, they're so planted in such quantities, the scale is everywhere. And if you don't have any maintenance budget, they're right. It is the best overall tree. Very low maintenance native species. It's very tolerant of a plethora of soil types. But if you could be a little more creative to find another best tree for the landscape. That would be great. It's a, what I call the, the best if you have no other options at this point. It's just very <laughs> overly planted. Uh, I, I desire more creativity. Landscape is supposed to inspire your mind and it just gets a little bland when you look at rows and rows of willow oaks. And To make it even better, they now have high tower willow oaks. So they all grow exactly the same. Way. So they're not, they're not even variable in growth habit anymore. So it's just gets a little mundane at that point, but it is a good low maintenance native tree. Ball cypress are one of my favorite trees for wet sites. Um, Shawnee Brave is a beautiful one. It stays a little more columnier on you and the bark is a little darker brown, a little more cinnamon colored bark. Really interesting. Um, variety of Ascendens. Ascendens used to be its own species. They call pond cypress. Now they're grouping it back as a variety of bald cypress. Uh, ascendants tend to be a little more upright columnar, a lot narrower. They don't quite get triangular in form. They stay upright columnar. A lot more of a fine texture from a distance. And this fox red has a really red fall color where most of your bald cypress go more of a yellow to bronze. Not nowhere near. This fox red is amazingly red. Fits in great with uh, black gnomes. Give you a little idea of what I've seen it do. Um, another dwarf. <laughs> Always take in context the species you're dealing with and what's dwarfed about it. <laughs> See, that's a full grown man with, I think, a, a 15 foot pole, and that's a nursery. So, I mean, this is not an arboretum. They're, they're growing them and selling them where they're bulldozing them, and they got that tall. So they sell it as a dwarf, they tell you it's a dwarf, and it's got these nice dwarf needles and this stacked habit. It's real interesting. 
uh, maybe a great candidate for like a container where you can, by soil volume, dwarf how big it gets. But if you plant it in soil in a wet spot, just know that it will get very large. But it's a it's a showpiece of an interesting plant in the summer when sometimes things get boring, it's hot, and all your flowers get eaten by insects and there's bugs everywhere. This thing will give you some interest, something to draw your draw your eye away from those beds that sometimes suffer. Here's a picture of little ID stuff in the very background sticking up. We've got some metasequoias. You'll see the texture difference more than anything. And then we got upright ball cypress behind the weeping ball cypress. So that's Cascade Falls in the front. And they weep and you can make them do archways pretty easily. And you can train that little whip of a leader. You can hard prune the top of it, and it'll send off a bunch of them. You can make it go like an umbrella. They're a neat little weeping ball cypress. Fun to play with. They grow relatively quickly, too, so it's something you can play with and see some results kind of a few years later. You have something to show people. Um, ball cypress have always been just a great tree in the fall for me. So you've got a neat form, nice and clean when they drop their needles. Pretty traditional. And here's a yellow wood. This is a frustrating tree for me over the years. It's native to the south, not so much native to Georgia. I like the trying to be creative in the landscape. We talk about what's native, and I say, are you trying to restrict me to like a county list? <laughs> <laughs> or how far can we go? I try to stay southeast a lot of times. It gives me a little more leeway. But this yellow wood will do great. It, it handles heat fairly well. Uh, after I killed a few of them, I kind of realized where they're native, the soil pH is a lot different. <laughs> so if you're dealing with yellow woods, you really like yellow woods, you've always wanted to grow one. Along with some good fertility, if your pH is not correct, uh, it likes a little higher pH than we tend to have in Georgia soils. So some pH buffering goes a long way with the yellow wood. And I collected this new one. They grow, they're growing them in Hawkinsville in the full sun now. So the people that know how to grow the trees, they're proving it. They're growing them, they're sizing them up in fields in Hawkinsville. So I, I bought a Perkins Peak from them this year. So it's supposed to be a yellow wood with a light pink flower. And I'm uh, interested to see what it does. You know, these things only flower every two to three years, so we might have to wait a little while. And here's the native smoke tree. Uh, I have found some people growing these in nursery fields. I think I bought some that were 14 feet tall B&B &B, and they transplanted great. They didn't even realize they were moving. Uh, flowered the same season, absolutely no dieback, very dense heads, fresh off the transplant. Um, low maintenance at its finest, real interesting. When they leaf out, they leaf out really early in the spring, about the Bradford pears are starting to flower. And the leaves come out a real chartreuse. You see how they're kind of light green on the tips? They come out real chartreuse, light green, and they give you a little bit of foliage interest in the early spring, along with that flower, which is late spring to early summer, kind of right there in the gap when a whole lot of other stuff is kind of in a transitional period. And here's the one that, yeah, I know, uh, the velvet cloak is oriental cultivar with that purple foliage. And everybody in the South wanted these velvet cloaks and all these purple oriental smoke trees. But in the South, they do not live in hard red clay soils. They do not tolerate our soils at all. You pretty much have to plant these oriental ones in containers and watch them die slowly or take a lot of care of them. <laughs> repot it, repot it, treat it like a citrus tree, but you never get a fruit. <laughs> a lot of work, not a lot of bang. So, uh, some of the, the nice breeders in the south, they, uh, we end up getting crossed with the native smoke trees. So they retain the purple leaves from the oriental, and the root zone got all the soil tolerance of the native species. And now we've got this real showy purple leaf one that you can plant it anywhere. <laughs> you get it, get it real fertile, you can tell it from China because it'll shoot off growth shoots four or five foot in a season. It grows really rapidly, really showy tree for the landscapes. Uh, if you're an ID nut like me, I put this slide on here top to bottom because if you look at leaves, most people you get in tree ID, you look at leaves. If you look at leaves, and you look at leaves on both leaves, you don't think it's an elm of some type. It is in the same family, different genus though, of course. Uh, 
American hornbeams on the top. Some people call it ironwood or musclewood. I always think of that because I'm not, I ID these by the bark. As soon as it looks like an elm leaf, I look at the bark. It's got a real smooth bark. It tends to be your American hornbeam. It's got this exfoliating peely bark, kind of like what you would expect on a white oak. Uh, it's this Oestra Virginiana, um, American hop hornbeam. And there, you see one of them's a dry site tree, one of them's a wet site tree. Other than that, they're very similar in form and function. So you've got you a nice little shade tree, understory tree, no matter if your soil is too wet or too dry. And it's a good native plant. Why I put these seeds on here? Because wildlife love these seeds. A lot of birds and squirrels and raccoons have a lot of wildlife action on these plants. So uh, two great native trees. And we transplant them and move them a lot. They take transplants fairly well. On the far side of that easy to transplant spectrum, we look at the sourwood next. Uh, sourwood native plants, fall color. Forget about a red maple. <laughs> sourwood. Much, much highly superior fall color. Probably the best fall color in a native plant in my opinion. Uh, beautiful flowers. You can see, you can identify these riding down the road when you see these flowerettes cascading off. They grow very slow. They're not the easiest guy to transplant, but my goodness, look at that on the corner of the house. When done right, if you have a little cottage type of landscape, and he's something that's going to stay in the family like a vacation property or something. I think a little sour wood, something that's going to stay 15 to 20 feet tall. It's going to keep you from putting that Japanese maple on the corner of the house. <laughs> and it's really going to blend you back into nature. It's going to do, it's going to perform better than any other plant right there. Uh, when I plant them in containers, I laugh. I know I'm buying a root ball a lot of times. My tops will die back to the ground and they shoot off the root ball and I have to train it from the roots again. That's how finicky sourwood has been for me transplanting. We've tried to field dig them at large sizes and maybe 10% success rate if you're field digging. So if you want your sourwood, you pretty much, I recommend getting it in a container, planting it perfect time of year, like December to January. Be really sweet on that root ball disturbance where they tell you to shave the roots off and not a sourwood. <laughs> you, you do a little bit of it, but just be a little more modest and a little more tender on the root zone because their root disturbance tolerance is very low. But great tree for the landscape. I, I normally, when I'm not at a native plant symposium, I catch, they catch your attention early and tell them I plant sweet gums for fun in landscapes. But this is, this is my pretty much exception of the rule. You need something urban tolerant, low maintenance, you got hard soil, too wet, too dry, you don't want to ever take care of it, but you need some type of breaking of the mundane brick wall. We plant a lot on big brick walls, little bitty hard red clay, confined root zone areas. They still have the fruit, but with the columnar structure, all the fruit fall right at the base of the tree. So they're, they're very low maintenance, nothing to do with plant it, forget it. And Something like this house on the right, it's almost the perfect way to use that tree in the front yard to frame in a big house. Nice low maintenance native tree. Good stuff right there, it's a beautiful plant. We, we plant them at four and a half to five inch trees, they're already 40, 45 feet tall. And we haul them in on semi trucks and prop them upright and plant them and they, they do well. They, you know, they don't, the tree don't even act like it was transplanted a lot of times. It's a great, great plant. Ooh, skip my hickory there. Uh, this is the hickory we put on our DOT project. It's the easiest hickory to find available on the market. It takes a transplant a little better than most. It's the hickory for dry sites that's going to be on the market to transplant. We found them in 30 gallon containers a few years ago that you can now buy them B and B in containers in the fields. They'll dig them out for you. Dry arid sites, drought tolerance to the gills. Uh, once you get it over to transplant for two or three years, you can pretty much forget it. Just do a little structural pruning here and there. It's great for wildlife, great for fall color. Um, just a beautiful plant. If you've got a wet spot you need a hickory, there's a Caria aquatica. And uh, that's a good lowland hickory that is also proven itself to be really easy to transplant because uh, transplant is often key to why you don't see hickories in the landscape. 
Here's another shot of these fringe trees. You see Emerald Knight is one of these cultivated varieties that I mentioned earlier. And there's an up close to how glossy the leaf is. If you're familiar with Grancy Graybeard and you see a shiny leaf like that, you wouldn't think it was a Grancy Graybeard. They always tend to have a real chalky leaf. But some of these new varieties are really shiny. It almost looks like you're polishing that leaf surface. Uh, bad and ugly. I left, this is probably the only bad and ugly slide I left in here. Uh, box elder. It's native species. Uh, for educational purposes, it's got a compound leaf. So it's a maple with a compound leaf. So when you've got Boy Scouts spinning their, you've got the brain thinking about trees, trying to get them interested. And they think it's easy. And then you show them a maple. This is a maple with compound leaf. And they actually learn something real good that way. So we do, we do plant these. They, they do have bad limb structure, weak, weak wood. So we don't put them around driveway, sidewalks, buildings. We just put them off near your wet area. If you have a drainage ditch on the rear of your property or something like that, it's a great low maintenance tree. Um, I start wanting this cultivated variety. You see on the screen, variegated. It's a variegated leaf form. I had to get it from California. So people think I'm crazy telling like order a box over from California. <laughs> But we, we got a whole load from them. We also got this other native species, uh, a catalpa tree. I love catalpa. And it's a high graft. So it's a native catalpa root zone, and a high graft are about five foot, and they call it nana. <coughs> Looks like a little bush on a stick. <laughs> but in these little triangular cutouts in concrete areas where you get poor drainage, you plant this little thing, and it grows about 10 to 15 foot radius from the stem. And it only gets about eight feet tall, so it has this Sahara Desert type of silhouette. And you get it, it's real just under your head, so you can walk underneath it, but it's real closes in. Uh, functionally, when you try to get creative, I see a lot of uses for it. I'm a, I like to fish, so these catalpa trees, these catalpa worms. The trees get big, you see the worms, you can't get them. If you plant nana catalpa, you can pick the worms from the ground forever. So uh, we're going to try to start talking some more people into planting those dwarf catalpas throughout. But that's another weird native plant that we acquired from gardens that these guys in California are the only people cultivating and, and try, trying to sell these. I ask them how many they sell and they kind of giggle. <laughs> they say in California that catalpa is really upcoming in these patio areas, formal urban patios and parks in between big structures, like something I could see in downtown Atlanta. They're putting benches and seating areas and putting these catalpas in the cutouts. Another great one. So the rest of it pretty much is just a few planting notes. When I'm looking at the species, we, we dig the hole three times as big, but we think of potential root ball area. Where are these roots going to want to go? So we try to address the soil ten times the size of that root ball. And I say that in regards to any type of amending. If the soil site is so poor, we have to amend. We've got to bring in organic material. No more of that amending the hole and the roots stay in the hole and it stays too wet. None of that. If we're going to amend, we go to 10 times. Go real far out and wide. If it's on a slope, we try to go downhill a little bit to ensure that we have a good drainage structure on that amended site. Uh, you, you see this little pedestal? I like to point out that pedestal because when you're trying to water in plants, sometimes you get by top of a root rot that you keep it a little too wet. So as you dig your hole, set that plant on an unbroken soil, and then beside it, dig it out a little deeper so that any excess water drains off the root ball. That's a huge key in preventing Phytophthora and helping you get trees rooted in. If it's a wetland species, not so much. If it's a red maple, tulip poplar, don't do that. But if it's an upland species, dogwood, Japanese maple, anything like that that wants good positive drainage, on the side of that hole, we always dig out a little extra deep to keep that water from just sitting on that root. I'm going to slide through some of this. Root collars, always look for that root flare. You want to see a swelling base and structure roots leaving. You want that thing to be up in the air. You ever seen a root jump out of soil and try to choke itself on the tree? No. So if you keep the soil off of that flare, you will eliminate the possibility of ever getting a girdling root that will be detrimental long term. And there's another modified planting hole. This is, these are actually photos out of my planting contract. Uh, slide through. 
So here's our ideal slide of how we mulch. Even when we put out wood chips and mulch, we keep that flare visible. This flare is about an inch or two higher than the grass out here. Eight inches around there, we don't really put that much mulch. We just touch it with a little roundup when we have to or pull it out. And we're all the way out to about the drip line with wood chips or whatever type of mulch is available. And here's why we put the mulch. This is a little research slide from Bartlett Tree Experts. They planted red maples in a field. They, they planted one, they laid sod up to it. They planted another one, they left it bare dirt. They planted a fourth one, they put green wood chips fresh out of the tree chipper. You're going to like what I have to say that. Then they put one with dried mulch. That mulch picture is from the green wood chip mulch that they tell you not to use because it's detrimental locks nitrogen. That nitrogen locking is a short term thing, so we'll release it later. So if you're trying to be efficient and save money, you want to use a little bit of green wood chips. Make sure they're not more than three inches thick, which you don't want any of your mulch that thick anyway. So just keep them thin. And then know that you need to counterbalance that with a little extra nitrogen those first two to three, four years. And then as that decomposes and you just top dress with an inch of green wood chips, you've already counteracted it. It actually shows great dense roots, um, mainly because of the cost of wood chips we're swapping to a, a green layer and if it's a real high visibility area we'll go on top of it with dyed products so it looks like a million dollars but for budget efficiencies uh so there's some research showing that green wood chips aren't quite as bad as previously uh, described and we're uh we're kind of checking it out and i haven't seen a whole lot of detrimental side effects yet as long as you're on a good fertility management program if you don't fertilize properly and you're not paying any attention to your fertility, I can see how the green wood chips would be a big issue. I appreciate y'all having me. At the end of my slideshow, I just put these lists of these evergreen native shrubs. As I, you hear about native landscape, and people like to say you don't have enough evergreen native material. So I put this list on there, and I'm just going to slow go through these and let you see some of my pictures. If you have any questions, feel free to email me or uh, ask me. I, Put some business cards and some leftover handouts on this front table. You're more welcome to grab one of these. Please come by if you're ever in Macon. Stop at the college. It's a, it's a free parking place and a free walk. We don't charge anything for admission. Uh, the library is public, so if you sign up in the public library, you have access to all our books and everything. You can check them out and drop them back off. Um, that's kind of a new one on the market right there. It's one of my new favorites. Uh, pink frost, that's what happens when the cold weather hits it in the fall. So it's a variegated form in the summer. It's just white and green. Then when the cold weather hits it, it turns that pink down in the petioles. Just a, one of Dr. Durr's creations, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> As always, keeps you in awe. Uh, Calmias. There's one called Southern Form. We're down in the deep south. So I'll put this on here for Southern Form Calmia. They're collecting seeds in Louisiana from the southern most populous of native Calmia. They're germinating and selling them as a Southern Form. I put 10 of them at the college. I got two of them that think they're in the North Georgia Mountains. <laughs> they're dark green and they're growing six or eight inches a year. And we're going to keep passing those things around. And maybe we come out with the true cutting selection of a mountain laurel for the south. Right now it's just seed based distribution, but it's uh, up and coming on the market pretty soon. These dwarf wax myrtles, we use these things for hedges and formal patios. Tell people to let them run hedge cutters on right before the party. Keeps the mosquitoes kind of at a distance, all natural. It's, it's a nice little uh, critique on a landscape. It helped us sell a lot of projects in Macon throughout the years. <laughs> Get rid of the boxwoods, put native wax myrtles, and they all ooh and all and they, they giggle over it. They love the idea. So there's my native azaleas in our garden. These are pictures from our campus. That's the, the hardest one for me to grow, but my option the most rewarding right there. That Oconee azalea is just a, a hammer. And here's the credits to the peoples that I borrowed some slides from and helped me put some of this together. And if we overlook something in the beginning, I'll entertain questions and comments as long as we've got time. You'll see those are what we call advantageous roots. When somebody in the nursery pots that bare root at the bottom of the pot and fills it with soil so it stands up straight, <laughs> then it puts off roots trying to live 
And when you plant it, you think you're planting it at root collar, but it's not. It's actually getting root rot from the bottom, and it'll be a hollow tree at best. So inspecting your material as you buy it's key. You don't want that light tunnel, that 90 degree angle where the stem goes in the soil. That means it's definitely too deep. There's some issues there. That's what you should be looking at. That's after a root collar excavation on a oak tree of some type. And this tree was planted 14 years ago. You see the water baskets up there at the top? People like lying and say the water baskets will rot and corrode and rust away. It'll never be a problem. That thing was, the tree was growing all into the basket. And you could see uh, phytophthora rot oozing out of where the metal went into the tree. So it was definitely the point of inoculation for the fungus. And there was a lot of girdling roots. You'll see the girdling root mitigation. In a couple locations where they were curling over and strapping itself. This tree was 14 inches. The one on the other side of the driveway was 27 inches. <laughs> it's planted the exact same day. And it was mainly due to those girdling roots choking itself out. I do appreciate y'all for having me.